Still, after all of that, it is clear that there are lessons to be learned here and steps that must be taken to ensure that we're doing everything possible to protect our personnel and our facilities abroad. So in concert with the State Department and the intelligence community, we are in the process of developing enhanced security for U.S. persons and facilities in the wake of Benghazi. There will always be a tension between mission effectiveness for personnel, the ability to get out and do what they're supposed to do in these countries, and their physical security. We're committed to steps that avoid a bunker mentality, and yet we still must afford greater protection from armed attack. We're taking steps along three tracks. First, host nation capacity. We have been able to better assess and build up the capabilities of host governments to provide security for U.S. personnel and facilities. The fact is, as you all know, that our embassies and consulates depend on host country personnel to provide on the first line of security. And this episode raises concerns about the ability of some newly established or fragile governments to properly secure U.S. diplomatic facilities. To address these concerns, we are working with the State Department and considering how DOD can better help host nations enhance the security provided to our diplomatic facilities. We're permissible and appropriate and in collaboration with the Secretary of State and the U.S. Chief of Mission in the affected country, we believe that the Defense Department can assist in their development using a range of security assistance authorities to train and equip those forces in the host country, and we are doing exactly that. Secondly, we have to enhance diplomatic security. We've got to harden these facilities, and we again are working with the State Department uh, and to try to reassess diplomatic security overall. To determine what changes may be required, we assisted the State Department in the deployment of an interagency security assessment team to evaluate the security level at 19 vulnerable diplomatic facilities, including our embassy in Libya. And we're in the process of developing recommendations on potential security increases as, as required. As part of this review, we have also considered how the role, mission, and resourcing of the Marine security guards could be adapted to respond to this new threat environment. In the near term, we've agreed with the Department of State to add 35 new Marine security guard detachments. That's almost 1,000 Marines over the next two or three years in addition to the 152 detachments that are in place today. We're working with state to identify those specific locations for the new detachments. And we will identify any necessary resource and force structure adjustments in order to support this initiative. Although there was not a Marine Security Guard detachment posted to the Benghazi Temporary Mission Facility, Based on our review of all embassy security incidents that occurred in September of uh, 2012 in Tunis, in Cairo, in Khartoum, and in Sana'a, we have initiated coordination with Department of State to expand the Marines' role beyond their primary mission of protecting classified information. As some of you know, their primary mission is not providing outside security. Their primary mission is to protect uh, classified information. But we believe that we can try to augment their role into uh, terms of providing greater security protection as well. This could include the expanded use of non-lethal weapons, additional training and equipment to support the embassy regional security officers' response options when host nation security force capabilities are at risk of being overwhelmed. The third area is enhanced intelligence and military response capacity. We are focused on enhancing intelligence collection and ensuring that our forces throughout the region are prepared to respond to crisis if necessary. The United States military, as I've said, is not 
and frankly should not be a 911 service capable of arriving on the scene within minutes to every possible contingency around the world. The U.S. military has neither the resources nor the responsibility to have a firehouse next to every U.S. facility in the world. We have some key bases, particularly in this region. We have some key platforms from which we can deploy. And we have forces on alert, and we're prepared to move. But our ability to identify threats, to adjust posture, to prevent plots, and respond to attacks to our personnel at home and overseas depends on actionable intelligence and it always will. Therefore, we're working with the State Department and the intelligence community to ensure that our collection and analysis is linked with military posture and planning. We're working to enhance our intelligence collection, to improve the responsiveness of contingency assets, and to adjust the location of in extremis reaction forces. At the same time, we're working closely with State to ensure they have our best estimate of response times for each at-risk diplomatic facility so that they can make the best informed decisions about adjustments to their staff presence in areas of increased security threat. We've deployed key response forces abroad. We have reduced their response time. But let me again say to you that even those those forces that are on a tight alert time of N plus two, notice plus two hours to be able to get on a plane. Once those forces are put on airlift, it still requires many hours in that part of the world to fly distances, long distances, in order to be able to respond. I firmly believe that the Department of Defense and the U.S. Armed Forces did all we could do in the response to the attacks in Benghazi. We employed every asset at our disposal that could have been used to help save lives of our American colleagues. We will support efforts to bring those responsible to justice, and we are working with the task force involved uh, and headed up by the FBI to do just that. As I said, going forward, we intend to adapt to the security environment to ensure that we're better positioned and prepared to support the Department of State in securing our facilities around the world. But in order to be able to effectively protect the American people and our interests abroad, at a time of instability, we must have an agile and ready force able to quickly respond. And above all, and forgive me for being repetitious, we have got to end the cloud of budget uncertainty that hangs over the Department of Defense and the entire U.S. government. I've got to use this opportunity to express again my greatest concern as Secretary, and frankly one of the greatest security risks we are now facing as a nation, that this budget uncertainty could prompt the most significant readiness, military readiness crisis in more than a decade. Department of Defense faces the prospect of sequestration on March 1st. If Congress fails to act, sequestration is triggered. And if we also must operate under a year-long continuing resolution, we would be faced with having to take about $46 plus billion out of the defense budget, and we would face a $35 billion shortfall in operating funds alone for our active forces, with only a few months remaining in the fiscal year. Protecting the war fighters, protecting the critical deployments we have, we're going to have to turn to the one area that, that we have in order to gain the funds necessary, and that's readiness. It's maintenance. This will badly damage our national defense and compromise our ability to respond to crises in a dangerous world. The responsibility of dealing with this crisis obviously rests with the leadership of the nation. I know the members of this committee share the deep concerns that I've raised about sequestration. And obviously, I urge you to do whatever you can to try to avoid this threat to our national defense. 
State Department and the intelligence community obviously also must be provided the resources they need in order to execute the, emission, the missions that we expect of them, including the enhancements that I've described today. Whatever steps are required to be taken to properly posture U.S. forces for possible emergency response operations, those steps would be seriously impacted by the readiness crisis caused by uncertain resources. We have a responsibility, and I take that responsibility seriously, to do everything we can to protect our citizens. That responsibility, however, rests with both the executive branch and the Congress. If we work together, we can keep our Americans safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Panetta. General Dempsey.